welcome uh, to our gallery chat to discuss uh, the genome, uh, well, I always want to call it genome project, but the uh, genome artwork in the Molecular Biology Building. I'm really delighted that we have um, three panelists here and hopefully we'll have a lively discussion. I have some questions prepared. Um, we do have a couple of different ways that we're showing our program today, so we're going to do our best to do that seamlessly. We have Facebook Live so you can watch it as a stream and then also as a recording and then we have our audience here. So thank you all for being here. Um, today I'm joined uh, by our panel of Dr. John Connolly. He is a professor in the art department. Uh, he teaches art history. Uh, Clark Wol Dr. Clark Wolf uh, is the director of the bioethics uh, program here and Claire Creasel, uh, who is assistant teaching uh, professor in the English department. Um, and I am Lila Anderson, the educator of visual literacy and learning for university museums. So I actually want to allow them to give a much better introduction of themselves. And along with introducing themselves, I'd love for you each to tell us a little bit about what you wrote about in your interpretation and uh, a little more about why you were drawn to writing on this specific work of art. Well, I'm going to just kind of hand this over to whoever wants to. Clear take first? That first. Let's go in order. You can start here, John. <laughs> <laughs> sure, Clark. Oh. Well, thanks for that introduction, Lila. Thanks for the introduction, and thank you all for coming out during our first taste of winter here. I certainly wasn't ready for it. Um, well, as Lila pointed out, I teach art history uh, in our uh, College of Design. And um, an art historian is kind of the, uh, I guess, the modern version of the old tribal genealogist who knows who everyone's ancestors are and could tell you, you know, what your grandparents did and your great grandparents. And to me, um, works of art, you know, have a genealogy and you can, you know, determine, you know, who was the parents, you know, mother, father, whatever, um, whether it's, you know, Jackson Pollock or Picasso or, you know, um, excuse me, but I'm not used to declaiming <laughs> in a mask. So I think, yeah, this, this seems good. You know, keep the germs in and let my voice come out. All right. Uh, so this particular building, the Molecular Biology Building, I thought, uh, when it was built was really a great thing to teach about for my students because it's so historically oriented. The, um, the sculptor, Andrew Lester, was definitely interested in many different periods of art history and you know, shows that, you know, ancient Greece, the medieval period, um, the Renaissance, uh, Minoan Greece and so forth. Uh, so it's a, a, a good place to teach students about how contemporary art is really, um, you know, uh, uh, is really a repository of all of the art of the past. So um, that's my reason for liking this building and seeing it as a, uh, as a great teaching tool. Um, like so many other buildings uh, on campus, we're lucky uh, to have such a variety of period architecture just um, you know, within a stone's throw of where we sit here. Sure. Thank you. Um, so as, uh, as a bioethics program director, I run a workshop every summer in the, bio, in the bio, Molly Bio building for science teachers from around Iowa, and I always take them around the building. In fact, Whenever anyone comes to campus, when my parents came to campus to visit me, I took them around campus and I sure took them through Molly Bai. When visiting instructors come, I, when, when we have job candidates, I take them, them to this building because I think it's so interesting. And um, what I'd like to say about this building is that it shows enormous chutzpah for the university to have chosen this as the design for a science building, and enormous chutzpah for the, the state to have chosen this design for the center of biotechnology on campus because the artist, Andrew Leister, has used this as an opportunity to raise ethical questions and regulatory questions about the impact of biotechnology on the world. And 
while I support the science that's going on inside this building, I think it's important for us all to be challenged in various ways about what we're doing. I think it's important to be able to defend yourself against people who would criticize what you're doing. And what I love about this building is that it is the instantiate, instantiation of a critical view of the science that takes place within it. And for that reason, some people dis who work in the building have questions about it or even dislike it. Um, one of the images or one of the items in the building that I didn't mention in my um, uh, blurb is the plates that are on the wall. And I, I'll just mention, you know, at one level you have creatures, look like natural creatures. At the next level, you have them divided up into component parts. And at the final level, you have them reorganized into new chimerical creatures that are, are quite different from the originals. And of course, that's what scientists are doing. Uh, in one respect, you remove a piece of DNA and you import it into another creature. Um, and that's an interesting thing to do, sometimes a valuable thing to do, a scary thing to do. And I think this building presses on us all of those issues. And that's why I love it, one of the reasons. Wow, how do I follow that? I, I share their views, their perspective on art history, in bioethics, in appreciating this art. And as a, a teaching professor in the English department, I'm right now teaching a biological communications class where as a capstone project, my students are going to have to argue from different sh stakeholder perspectives whether GMO salmon should be labeled for consumers. And this is 2020, and this building was, what, 1991? So it was very prescient of him to be bringing up these concerns, and they're still happening today. My perspective in writing on this, and you can read my blurb, is more personal. I have been at Iowa State since 2002 as a student, an undergrad, grad student, now an assistant teaching professor. So I love a lot of the art on campus, and it was really hard to pick one. But I thought, you know, what's a, a unique niche that I could occupy when I choose something to write about? And my connection to this piece of art that I chose, which is forbidden fruit. Oh, there are the plates he was talking about. You can see how they escalate up the, up the wall. Forbidden fruit is the woman who's kind of modeled after the Minoan snake goddess that you mentioned or alluded to. So that's uh, not quite here yet, but you know, 1500 to 2000 BCE. It's really an old piece of art. And he made a different version of it where instead of holding snakes, the woman is holding pieces of DNA. And that's the piece I chose to write about, but not because I like what it symbolizes, but because it's the first piece of art I ever saw at Iowa State that I made a connection to when I was in eighth grade. <laughs> I came here for nerd camp. I chose genetics. We stayed in Friley Hall. We walked over to Molly Bio, and it felt like, oh, there she is. There she is. She's scary, right? And she's creating life or changing life or making chimeras. I don't know. But my connection with her isn't, oh, symbolic. It's that once I became an undergraduate in biochemistry many years later, obviously influenced by the nerd camp, so good job, nerd camp, you got me to come, uh, we would have Thanksgiving there, we would have symposiums there, we would do pumpkin carving, we would do uh, cookie decorating, and we would, and I know this is probably wrong, decorate her. We put her in a graduation cap for a graduation. We put her in a pilgrim outfit for Thanksgiving, which of course needs to be revisited now. And we put her in a hula outfit other times, just for fun. And when I, I have a personal tragedy around this building, when my fiance, who was also in the BBNB program with me, uh, died, actually who was hit right outside the molecular biology building, uh, we used that space, that atrium as a place to gather and mourn and we had a picture of him by that piece of art, and you know, I write more about this in my blurb. So it became a really personal touchstone for me, totally disconnected from what she was symbolizing. And that's what I wrote about. But you know, I still have this appreciation that these two gentlemen have expressed. Can I follow up just a bit? Yeah. Because um, one of the things that I do love about this, the goddess, and she's glaring down you know, with baleful red eyes, glaring at what's going on. But every time I go into the building, she's decorated with something else. And I, I, I do think that the graduate students in biological sciences regularly redecorate the goddess in the atrium. And the last time I walked through, she was wearing a COVID mask. And um, you know, it's, it's perfect, it's wonderful. I don't know if that's what Andrew Leister had in mind, but certainly that's one of the 
principal ways in which people who inhabit this building regularly interact productively with the art that's in it. Yeah, I could add a little odd history footnote to that. I mean, in many societies, the statues of gods or goddesses in the temples are decorated with clothing and jewelry. And I mean, uh, in Athens, um, every four years, the Athenians would uh, change the uh, clothing of their you know, ancient sacred statue of Athena uh, up on the uh, Parthenon. It was a feeling that if it really is a living deity there, you know, you ought to change its clothes now and then. And, you know, um, and it was a very proud thing to be one of the embroiderers, or one of the people selected to carry that robe there. So it's interesting to see what seems to be a vestige of a very ancient practice still going on spontaneously uh, without an art historian telling them to do that. <laughs> um, that's wonderful. So, um, some of you touched on this um, in your introduction, but at the time of uh, its installation, so in 1991, these works of art were fairly controversial. Um, as you remember, we're at the beginning of the Human Genome Project. Sequencing DNA is a very new field, um, and we're met with uh, some, so this artwork was met with some resistance by those who were working in the building. Um, and so I wanted to take, talk about um, how you believe uh, Leicester's artwork interacts with the student staff, faculty, and researchers that are working in the building today. And you can also talk about that time period as well if you want. Well, at that time period, I didn't really know what genetics was, I'll be honest. I'm a little, a little younger than that. but. Uh, I think we already talked a lot about how that one statue is a touchstone, a symbol of what the, the group is going through and, you, you know, unites students, faculty, staff. When I was, I was an undergrad in biochemistry and then I did grad research uh, for a master's degree in biochemistry. I completely love the art. I always love the art. I would be, you know, on the fourth floor looking out at the plates that I could see at that level and trying to decode it and telling everyone about it. So I never had an issue with that and I actually never Countered anyone that I can recall who said they didn't like it. So I don't think I have a lot to share to that end, but maybe you do. I sure. Well, I, I think there's an adversarial tradition in truth finding, right? So our courts, in, in court, you have the best defense that can be given for the defendant and the best case that can be made for the, for the prosecution. And the court is supposed to wind up with the truth by looking at the the two cases. And I think this building enacts kind of the same combative view of how to find the truth. So this building is a direct challenge to many of the people who are pursuing science in the building. And because I favor I, I, an adversarial process, I think it's important that we be able to defend ourselves and defend what we're doing against those who think it's questionable or th think it's wrong. Uh, so this building forces people in that building to think and to address in some way or other, at least uh, internally, the views of people who disagree with what they're doing. And I, I think that's remarkable. Uh, I don't know of another building that accomplishes what this building, uh, what this building does. This idea of the adversarial stance, I mean, from a art historical point of view, that is very old and traditional too because, of course, it's part of the modern tradition of the avant-garde artist who, you know, creates art objects that are disturbing and uh, cause us to think. But even going back further afield, I mean, there have been many important masterpieces we accept today as landmarks of art history that in fact were um, disliked at the time, at least by many people. Did you know when Michelangelo's Statue of David was being moved from the studio where he made it to the uh, Palazzo Vecchio, there were crowds of people who tried to stop it and threw stones at it. Um, and, uh, and uh, Michelangelo's painting of the Last Judgment in the Sistine Chapel ceiling was denounced violently by many of the clergy 
as being indecent and heretical. Now those voices we don't hear anymore. They've been erased from the art history textbook. Um, but I would say that Andrew Lester ought to have been proud <laughs> that there are at least some people who complained that his work made them uh, uncomfortable. I should also point out something we all need to be reminded of. We only have Andrew Lester's work in the molecular biology building thanks to the uh, one half of 1% art in public buildings um, project that the state had at that time, which I, as I understand is no longer, you know, Governor Reynolds, um, you know, has basically erased that. Um, and uh, when you have that, uh, you're going to have public art, you know, that, uh, you know, often the public who use those buildings aren't too pleased with, although later they become happy with it. When I went to school in Philadelphia in the 70s, there were many people who complained of that kind of public art money going to set up Claus Oldenburg's clothespin. If you've ever been to Philly, you know right across the street from City Hall, there's a 35-foot clothespin standing there. Um, you know, uh, uh, and there were any number of people, I remember, who thought this was the awfulest waste of money now the people of Philly are so proud of it. You know, I mean, they put it on their stationery. It's part of the logo of the city. People say, meet me at the clothespin. Um, they say, object to it? No, I never objected to it. Who's talking about that? I mean, they've erased that from their memory. So the more things change, the more they remain the same. I'd like to think that over time we'll adopt uh, Molly Bio, maybe on our Iowa State stationery. Maybe that's too much to ask, but embrace it fully. Um, so you can kind of tell, we, we did want to include this slideshow that's running behind us of images of the building, because I think it's very hard to get a sense of the whole installation um, from images. And of course, the objects that um, our panelists have written about our preparatory studies and drawings that Leister produced um, for this project. But the, the actual installation includes nearly 50 individual components, and they're all very intimately connected with the architecture of the building. And so I want to talk about how this integration of the art and the architecture maybe changes how you interact with the work of art. Or just comment on that architectural mm -hmm. connection. Anyone burning to go first? I'm, I'm glad to. No, go ahead. Well, if you've ever heard Lynette Pullman talking, and this is a, a subject of hers, and you know, for a long time she was the engine or motor behind the Art on Campus uh, project that would help select uh, these public art uh, uh, things here. She brings up the term plop art. Plop art is where you use that public art money uh, just to buy some big abstract statue and then plop it in front of the building and there you've taken care of your one half of one percent uh, funds and in many cases that statue was not made with that building in mind and might have been sitting there in the artist's studio for years until you know <laughs> you got a chance to get rid of it thanks to you know this public art uh, committee um, that um, isn't working too hard uh, but just takes this. But you know the committee that picked Le Lester was indeed working hard, and the idea of having an artist making an artwork that is really specific to the location and is designed with the building and its purpose in mind, you know, is a wonderful thing because so many of these public art works of art are not like that. Um, but again, going back to the ancestry of it all, I mean, uh, uh, before modern times, there was no such thing as a freestanding statue you know, that could be put anywhere. They were always made for a particular church, a particular palace, a particular uh, location in a public place with, um, you know, local 
ideas, needs, and concerns in mind. And here it's good to see that, you know, we're still keeping up that ancient tradition. So with integration of the various bits, I've been leading students and visitors through Mali Bai for 17 years now, and I still find new things when I go into that building. I still find, you know, by looking more carefully at the plates, I figure out what's in them. By looking at the splatches on the walls, right, you see that they're DNA, actually fragmenting DNA strands. By looking at various different uh, murals on the walls or, or, or mosaics on the floor, it, th this building is packed uh, with meanings. And um, the meanings are not always obvious. So with, with the goddess and the atrium, I have variously interpreted her meaning as a goddess of nature who's pissed off at what's going on in the building and a mad scientist who's breaking DNA apart and doing something that the artist disapproves, which I think is what Leister had in mind. But I always think of her as the, you know, the, the evaluating, judging eye looking down on the building. And um, I think she integrates the whole thing. <laughs> you know, I think, Claire, you were right to pick her as a, as, as a centerpiece, because I think she's the centerpiece that brings the building together and integrates everything that happens. Well, speaking of that, one thing I've been reading about recently and thinking about is how goddess worship was the original worship, right? And as we became more literate and put things down on paper and use language, then there's a transition to more you know, masculine worship or more let's impose our views on nature worship. And that's a huge topic that I'm not an expert on, so you know, please don't hold me to that. I'm still learning about it. But when we look back at the Minoan snake goddess, she's holding the snakes as a sign of regeneration, as a sign of life. It's something positive. And then snakes became something different, right, when you go to Christianity. So like you said, we could interpret this different ways. She's holding the DNA strands. She's breaking them apart. Is it good? Are we going to use CRISPR to have uh, babies that can't get HIV, which is a controversial thing. If you don't know about it, look it up. Uh, or are we going to use it to heal, you know, it's just a tool and it is a form of regeneration. So I love that it, it, there's not a direct answer. I think we know what the artist intended, but that's only half of the equation. And then speaking to the integrity of this installation, it's an experience. I feel almost cared for when I'm in the building. I feel like it's alive. I feel like it has an experience in mind for me. I mean, the first time I drove by it and saw the DNA on the side of the building, I was just like <laughs> in love. We don't see that on other buildings. There's not, you know, hexane going down Gilman or whatever. So I think it's, it's really thoughtful and it's so different than this modularity we have in modern public art. I'm on the public art commission for the city and I love it. I think we're doing great work. But you know, we have concrete pads for where the art goes. Let's have a call for artwork. It has to be this big, it can't be sharp, it can't fall over. I mean, it still does, does anyway sometimes and we have to fix it. There's no uh, site-specific call for art. Sometimes there is, but it's rarer. It's harder to do, and I think that's related maybe to capitalism. It's just easier to have these modular pieces of art. So I commend everyone involved in this and how integral and integrated it, it is. Um, so maybe you've already sort of answered this in some ways of, <laughs> um, you know, with all these different individual works of art that make up the larger installation, um, I'm wondering if there's any one in particular that you want to, I guess, tell one of our various audiences about um, that stands out um, in a way or why you, you know, is there one thing that specifically if some of our audience goes into that building, what you should you, maybe one thing that you should not miss in there. I'd love to talk about the hands coming out the back, and I think you do too, right? <laughs> we should, I'm just wondering if we should, um, could we like, could we pause it on that particular slide? So on, on the back of the building, and this is so interesting because as a, someone touring Iowa State, as someone who's not involved in the research in the building, you wouldn't necessarily see this. If you have a parking pass, that's a great place for parking. Maybe you'll walk by and see it. So these are, this is a piece of art installed over the back doors that researchers will see. And they're these hands gloved in black. Yeah, the previous slide. Oh, sorry, I have to like figure out how there to they are. Out 
And this photo doesn't really do it justice to walk toward a building and see really big gloved black hands reaching out toward you. It's a little arresting, right? It's scary. And then there's these letters. And you have to spend some time wondering what it means. You have to like sit, stand there craning your neck looking at it. So if you're at home, I encourage you to look this up or zoom in or try to find it and figure out what it says. And I'll admit I can't remember and I can't totally read it right now. Do you know? I do, yeah. I thought you okay, <laughs> So whenever I take people on a tour of this building, I always wind up, I mean, if, if the weather permits, I always have them stand outside and look up at these hands, which are threatening black hands that reach out from, you know, it, like rubber gloved hands in a secure, envir secure scientific environment that you have to protect from human interaction. And um, I always, I, I, if you, if you look, there's a plaque below that interprets what those words say. But if you're looking at the artwork, it takes a few minutes, maybe sometimes five minutes, to figure out what the, what the letters spell out in uh, the artwork around the hands. And I think it's a, it's a message from Andrew Leister to the rest of us. Should I tell people what it's, what's on it? Or should I urge that you go to the building and look at the... Many, many of us can't, I guess, get there, so, yeah. It, it, it's all right. I mean, what, what it says is human beings are not yet wise enough to direct the course of evolution, right? That's what it says. Now, I don't know what directing the course of evolution means. I mean, in one sense, we direct the course of evolution when we select a pet, when we grow a garden, when we select a mate when we feed our children rather than letting them starve, we're directing the course of evolution in, a, in all sorts of different ways. So I think I know what Andrew Leister has in mind when he puts that in front of us. And it is, if you are a scientist engaged in genetic engineering that is going to change the species with which you interact, that means something very specific. And I think it's interesting to have that injunction above the door that people enter every morning. <laughs> it's not that I necessarily agree with Andrew Leister about the nature of, uh, of genetic engineering or directing the course of evolution. I think I would have things to talk with him about that. I think, though, when I've read other statements by Leister, I think his underlying concern is that biotechnology poses the chance that, that it may dramatically alter the natural world that we live in. And I think that's a real concern, and I think it's a concern that people should be addressed with when they enter that, that building and engage in, in this kind of work. I think it's a concern that should be at the tip of our cerebrum when we're thinking about these, these things. Uh -huh. Actually, um this is certainly a fascinating item, but it has a pendant, a, um, a partner on the other side of the building, the Sphinx. Yeah. Do we have the Sphinx? Yes. Yeah. And of course, the Sphinx is a very ancient creature, but it was typical on ancient temples to put the statue of a Sphinx or some other scary monster as an apotropaic device, that means to keep evil away, and also to warn the people who are going to worship there that they need to have clean hearts and good minds in order to uh, uh, do it in a righteous way without being punished by the gods for polluting the sacred space by coming to it in a, you know, a wicked or a uh, selfish frame of mind. So Lester seems to have known his ancient mythology uh, and, um, and, of course, the Sphinx is also wonderful in having Pandora's box and the cornucopia or horn of plenty on either side, meaning that whatever goes on here could perhaps be like Pandora's box and bring us troubles and woes, or it could be like the ancient cornucopia, which was always filled with goodies. It could bring us wonderful treasures and end hunger and bring world peace and so forth. So it's as if we have the choice. Uh, but watch out, the Sphinx is watching us. 
The letters surrounding the Sphinx are also significant. They represent the, the, the elements that make up DNA. And I don't know whether Leister selected them in order so that they are a specific identified genetic sequence, but it wouldn't surprise me to find out that he did. And I, I have not been able to discover that, but Ooh. I'd love to be able to ask him. I wish I knew the answer to that for you. Yeah. So I want to make sure we have some time today to answer our audience questions. I don't know if we have any through our Facebook Live, but you have questions. Um, I do have one more question for them, but I want to make sure we have space for our audience. So, Lila, could you please explain what happened with the genomes that were up in the corners of the building and what has taken place since their original uh, sure. placement there? Sure, and you, you all can add in too, but basically, so the, the genomes that, um, the question was, can I explain a little more about the replacement of the genomes at the top of the building? So, uh, they were originally made in terracotta, and I can actually go to a picture of some of these so you can see what I'm talking about. Uh, and they were had to be replaced. Um, and here I had a picture of them on their crane descending. This is the new genome that were fabricated. Um, I think they just we didn't the artist didn't, he didn't necessarily take into account how harsh Iowa weather is and all the changes. And they are at the top of the building, getting snowed on and rained on and beat with sun. And, Wind and so terracotta, while very strong, um, wasn't quite um, up for that placement. So these are now um, replaced to be more sturdy. And I can't remember the exact date of this. So they actually, I think they have the blade rounds up into them, which then produce the areas where water can go in. And terracotta elements have been not particularly great with water resistance, especially with some blades. So it just started, they started.